Okay, hi everybody. This is Kara Maciel from Con Maciel Carey. With me presenting today is my partner Mark Trapp. Today we're talking about strategies for success in collective bargaining. Um, I'm pleased that you are able to join us. This is part of our firm's uh, annual series on labor and employment topics where we do monthly webinars on a variety of different issues that are impacting employers. And today we're talking about traditional labor relations for really unionized workplaces. Um, as I mentioned and you see in the Q&A for housekeeping matters, this webinar is going to be recorded and we will circulate a copy of the recording as well as all the slides to everyone who registered for the webinar after the program today so that if you want to share it with others uh, in your workplace, a company that might find it useful or want to have the material to reference at a later date, you'll have that. Also, as you see in the Q&A function, please don't hesitate to type in a question during the presentation and Mark and I will leave time at the end to talk and answer any questions that you may have. So let's just go ahead and jump in a little bit about me. Um, I am the founding partner of our firm. We've actually founded almost five years ago this month, so we're excited to celebrate that anniversary. I think it actually popped up today on my LinkedIn profile. So um, it's officially five years, but we have been, um, a, we're a boutique law firm focusing on labor and employment and Workplace Safety OSHA. I chair our firm's labor and employment practice, and I, I do everything soup to nuts in labor relations, including um, negotiations, collective bargaining negotiations, representing companies in, before the National Labor Relations Board, either through elections or ULPs. I also advise non-union employers on strategies and programs to address workplace issues and avoid uh, unionization. And then I also do uh, employment litigation, employment counseling as well. I'll let Mark introduce himself. Hi everybody, I'm Mark Trapp. I am also with Con Maffio and Kerry and happy to be here. I am in the Chicago office. I've got almost 20 years of experience now doing this, which makes me feel very old, but uh, I'll soldier on nonetheless. I have a a broad array of labor, employment, and multi-employer pension experience and uh, represent employers throughout the country dealing with um, collective bargaining, election campaigns, uh, ULPs, grievances, also do a fair amount of employment litigation and handle uh, withdrawal liability matters uh, dealing with multi-employer pension funds. So today's agenda for the webinar is, uh, is here. We're going to talk about some strategies and keys to effectively prepare for collective bargaining. If you have any bargaining or union contracts that are coming up, there's a lot of things that you should be doing well in advance of that expiration of the contract. So we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about prioritizing and formulating some strategies um, before you even get to the table. And then once you're at the bargaining table, some successful execution of these strategies that you have implemented and planned with your team. We'll then move to talking a little bit about you know, maximizing savings during the negotiations and how you move towards a final agreement or p potentially impasse if that's possible. But for the most, most of the time, in my experience, um, we're able to reach agreement at the end of bargaining. And then Mark and I will talk on some of the two critical issues that we see arise in negotiations, and that's healthcare and pension fund options. So with that, I'll just jump right in. Mark and I are going to tag team a little bit um, the first half of the presentation, and then he's going to uh, focus in on pension withdrawal liability. But for those of you that are thinking about bargaining or have a contract that's going to expire in 2020 um, or even beyond that, it's really important that you prepare early and prepare often. You really always want to be thinking of the next contract and you want to be thinking not only yourself, if you are the labor relations person or human, you know, human resources executive in your company, but also your team, your managers, those departments that are implementing the terms of the contract, you want to make sure they're always thinking of the next contract and what are the issues that are popping up during the term of the contract that you may want to resolve or clarify or simply change 
at the next time you come to the table for negotiations. So keep a negotiations file. Think about those grievances that have been filed, if you have any unfair labor practices, any disputes or disagreements on how the, the collective bargaining agreement is interpreted. And then certainly as your operations change or your workforce changes, think through some of those issues that you, again, want clarity on later and keep that file so that you've got it ready to go as you start to prepare for bargaining. The other thing you want to do is you want to make sure you're identifying key dates. So per certainly put on that calendar when the CBA expires and in advance of that what your deadline is to notify the union that you want to start and commence bargaining. Sometimes the union will send that initial letter saying they want to initiate bargaining, but if they don't and if the employer doesn't send a letter, there's an argument that you could have an evergreen clause and that collective bargaining agreement will automatically roll into and renew the next year with all the same terms and conditions. So that would, it would prevent you from coming to the table and really bargaining over some of these issues that you've thought about over the last several years that you've kept in your negotiations file. Okay, something else that we need to think of, some uh, perhaps additional deadlines may be if you are part of a multi-employer bargaining group. Uh, this comes up often in the hospitality industry with, uh, with hotels or um, uh, other hospitality employers or sometimes in construction or heavy highway contracts. You may be part of a group that bargains as a group of employers on your side of the table. If that is the case, there are some additional dates that you want to identify. Um, again, the, the expiration of the CBA and any deadlines for withdrawing from the group. There may be even uh, internal rules that the group has for withdrawing from the group. Uh, you may be part of an association that has its own um, standards for withdrawing. Certainly, uh, the NLRB generally uh, will look at it as if you haven't complied with those rules and certainly if bargaining has already commenced with the group, then you may be too late if you want to withdraw after bargaining has commenced. There may also be uh, dates that are set forth in, in the rules or even in the collective bargaining agreement themselves it, itself, so you need to comply with those as well because uh, while the interests of the employers may coincide for some period of time, if you have specific issues, that are not likely to be addressed in the multi-employer bargaining to your satisfaction, then you need to make sure that you are able to get separated from that group prior to the commencement of negotiations. A little tip there is if you want out, say so now. And I don't technically mean now, I just mean early, and early enough that you don't get stuck with an agreement that you had no intention of getting stuck with. Oftentimes we find, some, you know, the, the CBA does expire. You send that letter out to the union or the union has sent you that letter and you talk about dates for bargaining and the union never gets back to you and then lo and behold, the contract has expired and the union says, oh, I want an extension agreement. Let's extend this out for a couple of months. You know, if, if you happen to be in a city um, where the, you know, the multi-employer, you know, uh, agreement is expiring or, for example, in the hospitality uh, industry and you've got Unite Here bargaining with a lot of different hotel chains, you may be somewhere in their pecking order and they may decide, well, I want to get some of the big, big chains done first before I get to you. So it could be months and months before um, you're able to sit down with the union at the table. So what you want to think about is when the contract has expired, even if you have not signed an extension agreement that keeps the agreement in place during the time that you're, you're bargaining after expiration, think about what your obligations are after that contract expires. There is an obligation to maintain what we call status quo, which means you want to maintain the wages, you want to maintain health insurance, you know, the benefits, the, ter the essential terms and conditions of the benefits, your work schedules, just so it doesn't appear or otherwise create what is called a unilateral change. Um, during the after contract expiration. There are some items, however, that do expire when the contract expires if you don't have an extension clause. 
and that is your management rights clause, and that's your no strike clause. And the no strike clause is obviously the biggest issue. I mean, we've seen that with Unite here in, over the last year where they were striking major hotels in Chicago, in San Francisco. Uh, they're now in Philadelphia. I don't think they're striking in Philadelphia, but my, they do. That is a big part of this you know, this weapon that collective bargaining agreements are intended to avoid, right, to, to secure labor peace during the term of the contract. And when the contract expires, of course, employers need to recognize that there is um, that no strike clause that goes out. And so it may be important to have a strike plan in place as part of your strategy and thinking through what you're going to be doing. And if you think there is a possibility of striking, what, what do we need to do? Contact security, know your boundaries have potentially replacement workers, that's a whole nother, nother issue for your preparation leading up to bargaining and contract expiration. Also, we talk about the arbitration clause. You may be obligated to arbitrate post-contract disputes if the issue or the grievance arose during the term of the CBA, um, but generally once the CBA expires, so does the arbitration clause, so you're not required to take grievances to arbitration if it arises after that. And then a current gray area with the NLRA and NLRB in particular is whether the dues checkoff expires. That's one of the leverages that employers sometimes like to implement at the end of the CBA is, well, now we don't have to take dues out of your paychecks anymore. And so all of a sudden the employers are get, employees are getting a little bit more money in their paychecks, and it's just one way to communicate to them, hey, you don't need a union, you don't need you don't need to pay someone to be your advocate. You know, we're a good workforce too. But that's a little bit of a gray area as well. So I would just check with counsel if you decide to take that strategy after contract expiration. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Well, one other point on that: uh, the dues checkoff is that uh, for for many years, decades, the dues checkoff expired at uh, at expiration of of the agreement. In I think it was 2015, uh, maybe whenever it was, it was just a couple years ago that uh, the uh, labor board under o President Obama uh, held that the dues checkoff did not automatically expire. And so uh, the reason we say it's a gray area is because it was that way for a long time. It's not currently, but the labor board under President Trump is is likely primed to reverse that opinion and restore the precedent. Um, also, uh, moving towards prioritizing and formulating the, the strategies, again, start planning well in advance. Uh, some of the big ticket items that we're going to mention later on and get into a little bit more in depth is withdrawal liability is certainly at the top of the list and, and health care as well. But in particular with regard to withdrawal liability, <clears throat> know your pension fund and send a request for an estimate of your withdrawal liability well in advance. This is a good uh, reminder for companies, even if you're not getting ready for contract negotiations, you should do this. You have the right to do it once every year, um, and you should figure out what you would owe if you were to withdraw from the pension fund. Maybe you would have some other options available. To that end, you should perhaps figure out what the costs may be uh, associated with the 401k. Um, certainly, you don't have to offer a 401k, but if you are currently offering a pension as part of the uh, uh, collective bargaining agreement, if you were to uh, end that obligation and, and cease contributing to the pension fund, the employees are likely to be wondering, well, what's, wh how, how, what am I using for a retirement vehicle? So you should plan that well in advance as, as well and figure out the costs that may be associated with the 401k. Perhaps you've already got a 401k for the non-union members in your workforce. Perhaps you already have a 401k as part of the union workforce. That would be wonderful because you've already got that vehicle in place. In any event, make sure that you're planning it in advance and know the costs associated with these items. Um, performing your due diligence and figuring out, uh, you know, analyzing the trends, forecasting where the company is reasonably headed over the next couple of years so that you know how to uh, develop your proposals as far as wages, health care, uh, insurance, any of the other e so-called economic items. And start already at this early stage thinking of your 
opening statement at uh, the negotiations and what sort of theme you may have. Use the uh, numbers, use the actual statistics to back that up and develop your proposals around a theme that you can emphasize at key points throughout the negotiations. You want to definitely prepare proposals in advance of your first bargaining session. Um, this is going to be coming from your negotiations file or in your conversations with the department managers to say what are some things that you would want to change in this collective bargaining agreement. One of the things that I like to do with the team when I'm preparing for pr proposals and preparing for bargaining is if you could run this unionized workforce non-union, what would you want to change in the CBA to make it, a, you know, make it feel like it's a non-union workforce? Think about what are your priorities. Sometimes it could be as simple as, look, we have a lot of people who abuse the call off time period or sick leave proposal. And so if we want to make sure and implement in here that if someone's out for three or more days that they have to submit a doctor's note. And we have the right to follow up on that doctor's note if we don't think the doctor's note is legitimate. If that's a concern in affecting your operations, that would be something you could put into the agreement. Or vacation accruals. Maybe you want to have a cap on how much leave uh, you know, a member is able to accrue over time or over, you know, over several years. So things like that you want to make sure operationally. Because one of the things that Mark and I will say repeatedly is that everything is economic. Yes, you're going to talk about wages. Yes, you're going to talk about pension and health and welfare contributions. And those are certainly the, the prime economic issues. But everything in the contract has an economic impact to your workforce in the way that you schedule, in the amount of, of staffing that you need, the amount of overtime that you have to pay, just, just those little pieces. And so you want to think about how can you effectively structure your workforce and change the CBA to make it as effective for you as possible. Look at some of the issues that were raised in the prior negotiation and think about whether any of those need to be reintroduced. Um, there might be a change in the, in the situation. It may be that the health and welfare contributions are becoming so expensive and there are cheaper alternatives and maybe it is a good time to change out from the fund and into other health and welfare options, private options. So, Think about that. Um, remember too about you know the rights that they already have. I mean, you have if you have a strong management rights clause, look at that and detail it, and be comfortable that you can exercise your authority under that management rights clause. So you don't need to add anything into the contract that would limit your management rights. The contract in and of itself is really a limitation on what you can do in the workforce. Um, otherwise, without it, you're, you know, it's at-will employment and you can, you can do anything you want. But, so really be very mindful about the rights that you already have and not, not inadvertently inserting something that could limit that right. Think through also your past practice. If there is a past practice that has been in place for the past several years and you want to stop it, now is the time in negotiations to affirmatively cease from the past practice and tell the union that you are no longer abiding by that past practice. Um, otherwise, it could roll into a new contract. This is particularly true if you have taken over a CBA from another company or if you have acquired a new workforce with a CBA and you weren't the ones who negotiated it previously, there may be a situation where you have acquired the former companies past practices, and those not, might not be the past practices that you want to continue with this current CBA. Again, now would be the time during the, the negotiation process that you, you disavow those past practices. Your proposals, as always, should be detailed, written, and organized. This is part of your team. You want to put together a good team together of people, but think through, okay, here's what we're going to present. Here's our initial offering. Here's maybe our second round, third round. Keep a really good running chart of what is being proposed and what is being countered throughout the entire process. Um, these notes are going to be very important if you have a grievance later on about the interpretation of a contract proposal or contract clause, and that was discussed at, uh, during the negotiations. Your notes are going to be really critical in that regard. 
Okay. Um, to follow up on, on what uh, Kara said, you know, set, set the objectives and build your strategy around critical issues. And, and the way that I like to, to have this done is through your managers and others who will be implementing the terms of the contract or who have been responsible for the contract during its term, have them review the CBA. Uh, it's a good practice to have your, your managers review the CBA anyway, but certainly before collective bargaining, they need to sit down and I would have them review the entire contract to make sure that they're familiar with what's in it. What, what do the words of the contract actually say? Oftentimes you, in workplaces, people get so busy and, and caught up in the day-to-day -day operations of, of the, uh, the company that things fall through the cracks and you end up with, uh, well, that's the way things have always been done. But it turns out that that's not the way that things have to be done. And we find that unions often take advantage of, of managers who don't know the contracts, perhaps as well as, as he or she should, and that unions can say, well, this is the way that we've always done it. And that, that goes back to Kara's past practice comment that uh, they perhaps get a little more leeway than they should. And managers should be intimately familiar with the terms of the contract and know what's there. And sometimes, possibly, more importantly, what is not there. Um, so certainly have them uh, analyze that, review the, any ULPs or grievances, figure out what the objectives are, and build your strategy around those critical issues. You'll think that I'm a broken record by the end of the day, and I apologize because I bring up this withdrawal liability a lot. It's certainly something I deal with quite a bit, and it can often be the key issue. Now, a lot of employers that I deal with don't believe they could ever get out of the fund, or perhaps that they should. And I've, I've, they, they may be right, but I just urge employers to, to have all the information before you make that determination. And I'm certainly not telling employers you need to get out or, or you should get out or you should stay in. I, I don't know, but the employer needs to make sure that they have the information on which they can make an, an informed decision on that critical issue. It's often millions and millions of dollars that they're talking about, and you need to get the information to know what does it look like if you were to get out of the fund and what does it look like if you were to stay in. Um, that's just the, the basis for an informed decision. So. Urge, or urge you to, to do that. Also, um, analyze other operational issues, as Kara mentioned, scheduling, other um, cost increases. Figure out what's, uh, what's doable and, and what's not. What's the best uh, tactic for um, achieving the most important items to you? And remember, as, as, as Kara said, she said you, that we would say this quite a bit, and here it is, everything is economic. I've I uh, like to think generally don't separate the, the so-called economic from non-economic, and that's what unions will often throw out as, well, let's talk about language issues, or let's talk about non-economic issues, and then we'll move to economic. Um, I don't like that, that type of bargaining, but uh, um, for, for the reasons that Kara said, I think everything is economic. It certainly has an impact on the bottom line. If you do end up talking about those kind of items, just remember that this tip at the bottom, open is an option. So you may know and have done the analysis on what you're willing to do with wages or pension contribution or health insurance and, and those types of items. But the union will try to stake you out to some position early on. And I think one way that I've uh, approached that is to list it as open. Wages are open. We don't have to list like what we're proposing as an increase right away. Let's see how this plays out with some of these other issues. Uh, same with uh, health insurance con contributions or pension contributions or, or, or anything else that's like that. You can just list it as open. You may know it. Uh, you may have an internal guide that you, that you know, but you don't have to propose it right away um, to stake you to any, any position. And it helps you to eliminate some of, the, some of the other items before you're staked to a uh, position on those uh, bigger ticket items. So, you know, before you get to the table, you want to make sure you're, you're prepared on how those proposals will be communicated. Who's going to be your lead spokesman? Who's going to be able to respond to proposals on the finances? If there's an issue, you know, with, you know, calling and time and attendance, 
Is there someone at the table that's going to be able to give examples about why this is an issue, why you're proposing um, making the proposal? So you want to come to the table with examples, maybe some financial analysis, if, it, if there is a, a, an impact to the way that the company is moving or if there's been you know, some plant closures or some financial difficulties in the past few years and that's impacting your proposals, you want to be armed with some of that information um, depending on the way it's presented. You want to think about when you're going to be communicating with the bargaining unit. Generally, because this is a unionized workforce and they are represented by a collective bargaining representative for terms and conditions of employment, you need to communicate through the union. Um, however, there are times when you are able to communicate directly with the unit and directly with your employees. And so you want to understand when you can do that, over what topics you want to do that. Usually it's going to be a key concern or an issue and have prepared communications that you can then share both to the labor union, to their representatives, and to the unit. I'm dealing with a, a situation right now where we're going through some bargaining, and certainly we bargain with the union, but then we're hearing scuttle from the employees that it's the company that's delaying, and we're not, you know, we're the ones that are not engaging in, in you know, good faith bargaining. We're able to react to that messaging directly with the employees, by communicating information that we've already communicated to the union. And so we're staying within, you know, within our protocol under, you know, under the National Labor Relations Act, but it's important that you understand how and when and if you want to communicate um, to, the union, to the union members themselves during bargaining. Okay, so th this follows up a little bit with, with what Kara was just saying about uh, preparing for to communicate at the table, determine your bargaining committee. Who, who needs to be there? What are the needs at the table? Um, who's going to have some credibility and who should uh, serve as, as voice, for example? Um, you generally, I like to have one person act as the lead and you have others uh, of, on the team to support specific points that will be addressed during bargaining or to potentially rebut items that may be brought up or that are brought up by, by the union. Um, Kara's example about the use of, of uh, you know, time and attendance issues is, is a good one. You like to have people who sort of know the, the real story as to what's going on. And then one person who's going to articulate uh, the overall strategy and, and the proposals and be able to rebut um, issues raised by the union. One, one thing to note is this uh, reference to ad referendum here on, on the slide, how you can use that to your advantage. That's, uh, th that means that it's subject to agreement by others. And there may be things that, that come up that you don't want to commit to at the bargaining table that, uh, that one potential way to um, put that off or, or uh, um, delay the, the conversation on that until you can think it through is, is uh, have it subject to agreement by, by others who, who may not be at the table. Uh, by like token, you can bring that person in uh, potentially when you deal with, you know, sort of the final steps towards contract. And we'll, we'll, have, uh, we'll have a brief discussion about that in a little bit. You need to plan the logistics and coordinate the calendars. Uh, there, there are some ground rules that need to be um, negotiated, and you can do this uh, either ahead of time or at the um, first sessions, where you're going to determine uh, how many people, for example, can can attend the negotiations on each side. What time you're going to meet? Um, do you set a schedule right at the beginning? You know that that we're going to meet on every Tuesday for the next five weeks, or do you just set it one at a time and uh, have meetings ad hoc after that? That's generally what I prefer, but it could be that there are reasons that you want to set uh, more meetings than one um, r right up front. Uh, the place of negotiations is, is another thing that, uh, that needs to be hammered out. I generally don't like to meet at the uh, employer's place of em employment. It makes it very easy for others to drop in and, uh, or to be a distraction to what's going on on the, on the floor or out front. And uh, that's something that should be thought through. What's the expense if you need to rent, a, say, a, a conference room in a hotel? Who's going to pay for that? 
um, how many employees are, are allowed to attend, what about the time off that's necessary. All those issues should be thought through in advance so that you're not caught flat-footed uh, when it's raised by the union. Okay. You also want to think about, you know, the mindset for negotiations. As I mentioned earlier, you have all the rights uh, at, to direct your workforce, to operate your op operations, to plan for the future, to hire, lay off, discharge, except as limited by the CBA. So as I said at the outset of the webinar, the reason that you're sitting down at the table is an opportunity to improve your operations and make it even better of a workplace than it already is. Think about this as a triangle of the parties, really. So you've got um, three primary players, although we've got the pension fund that's out there as well, but you've got the union who's really serving as a wedge between your ability to communicate directly with your employees. And so you've got this triangle relationship where you have to go to the union to get these rules in place on how you, you operate and or direct your empl employees. And knowing that the union is a partner in this workplace is an important understanding and mindset for the negotiations on how there will be labor peace over the next few years or there could be labor strife over the next several years. The reason we have a pension fund as an asterisk is by signing on to the CBA, you have also maybe intentionally or inadvertently or not knowingly signed on to the pension fund trust documents. The pension fund is not a party to your collective bargaining agreement. They don't sign it. They're not sitting at the table with you. However, they have substantial control over the union. The union does not, the local union and the local union business representatives do not have a lot of flexibility in negotiating the pension rates or the pension contributions that are assessed each year, or even if you have a health and welfare fund, oftentimes the health and welfare fund also is this unknown party that's sitting at the table, but that has critical influence over the you know, a, a significant economic issue. That's health and welfare contributions, if you are contributing into the fund. I'm commencing bargaining in Philadelphia right now, and the, the union has sent us a health and welfare addendum agreement that we, they want us to sign on to. The Health and Welfare Fund is insisting that the unions get all of the employers to sign on to them as of November 1st, even though they don't know yet what the rates are. And it's kind of crazy. It's putting a little bit of cart before the horse. Why are we negotiating over something that we don't even know what's being put in front of us, but yet that's the unions are essentially saying this is what the trustees are asking and forcing us to do and they're really twisting our arm and we'd really like you to sign on to it. So they are these other entities outside of the, outside of the bargaining table that you need to understand play a role and, and maybe, again, get information from them uh, in advance of negotiation. Okay, we also need to, and we'll touch a little bit more on the, on the difference there between the union and pension funds in just a little bit with the, uh, with the withdrawal liability. But with, Keep in mind, uh, when you're moving towards an agreement at the table, one thing you really need is a solid record of the negotiations. Now, you're not allowed to record anything, so you need to have good notes, as Kara emphasized earlier. One person that I didn't mention when I was talking about the bargaining committee, because I knew this slide was coming up, is somebody to take notes. That may sound more like, oh, well, gee, that's a, maybe that's a menial task, but it's not. You need somebody that can take notes that understands the dynamics of what's happening at the negotiations and the, the uh, possible importance of the different uh, things that occur at negotiations and, and can uh, frame your notes in the best way to capture what actually happened with regard to the negotiations over the, over the various proposals. Um, for that reason, you need somebody who is, they don't have to write it down verbatim, but they need to make sure that they capture those key points in case uh, it ever becomes an, an issue, either through a, a grievance that could occur, you know, even later on after you have an, an agreement signed, or it could be um, an unfair labor practice charge. And the notes may be um, a very important piece of evidence in those uh, in those proceedings. So you want somebody that can that knows the importance of what's going on and can capture it. 
time and date stamps. I usually put, um, you know, Kara mentioned before that the proposals need to be detailed and written and organized. I usually have a time and date stamp uh, included right in the um, header or footer of the document. You know, if you print it out on Microsoft Word, it could say down at the bottom, employer proposal, uh, September 18, 2019, 10 a.m. And that way you know when, when these were presented. And I, I'll even, even then, I'll put a little note on it when I present it to the union. Presented to union, 10.04 a.m., uh, you know, on 9.19. And that way you have a record of what exactly was given to them. And you can keep some notes right on those proposals as you go through them and, and discuss them. And, and it'll, you'll know that that happened at that time. Um, keep a, a TA list, a tentative agreement list. As you reach agreement um, on the little pieces of, of the contract, I like to have a a TA list that I start and then add to throughout the negotiation. So when you reach a tentative agreement, everybody says, okay, yeah, that's a tentative agreement. You mark it in your notes. And then at the beginning of the next session, you can pass out, before you pass out any further proposals, a tentative agreement list so that everybody is uh, fully on board with this was a tentative agreement. And you pass it out just like you do the proposals. And it has a time and date stamp on it, just like it did the proposals. And we'll say, this was a tentative agreement. Um, you can also write letters between the sessions to say, I'm glad that we were able to agree on X, Y, and Z so that you have further evidence that, that, that those were agreed to. Uh, you're steering towards the, the items that you've determined are must-have items, these, these critical items. Uh, make sure that you're bargaining in good faith and make sure that you respond to information requests. Um, that's a rather broad statement uh, and uh, ask for details if anything uh, fishy comes up, but certainly unions are entitled to information that's relevant to their role as bargaining representative, and sometimes they'll, uh, they'll ask for information just to uh, cause you issues on your side of the table. But um, make sure that you know what, what they're trying to do and how to handle that. Now, as you're getting towards the end of, of bargaining and you're narrowing down the issues, you want to start to eliminate you know, the fluff, what we talk about, minor issues or things that you're willing to trade or package for in order to remove you know, these other proposals off your list and really come down to the final two or three issues. You want to understand whether there's a possibility that you need to declare impact. Impasse is a whole other subject I don't want to get into detail right now, but generally you need to understand how long have you been bargaining, how, what have been the length of those negotiations, what has been the good faith of the parties, how much letters have gone back and forth as to the understanding about whether some, you know, the parties are, are truly at impasse, which means that they are no longer moving from their position. Do you have you know, affirmative statements made by the union at the table that they are not going off this position. This is where the notes and the documents are really important. It's not easy. It is risky to have and declare impasse because more often than not, the union will file an unfair labor practice charge. So if you have the documentation and the notes, that's going to be very important. But just understand if impasse is an issue, how you get there legally and take all the steps during bargaining to protect yourself. And then as I mentioned earlier, also understand if you're at the point where your contract is about to expire, will the union strike? Um, understand how you're going to handle that, have a strike plan, and understand what will happen if employees um, cross the line. Okay, so this is also with maximizing savings and moving towards agreement that uh, fo sort of follows up on the, the point that I was making earlier. Put everything in writing regarding the deal. Like I said, have this TA list that you've compiled throughout negotiations and that everybody signed off on. When you get the final deal, you should be able to just convert that pretty easily to a memorandum of understanding. Get it signed b before you leave. Sometimes unions want to just shake hands and say, well, you know, we'll, we'll finalize this and then we'll do it. There's almost always some sort of issue that comes up when that's the case. So try to get it signed. Just say, no, I've already actually already got the TA list right here. Let me just add these final items and we'll sign off on it. Why spend all that time without actually getting it signed right there at the table? Um, 
sometimes, you know, if the union signs that agreement, then it will take the place of the collective bargaining agreement. They'll say, well, we want to have this subject to ratification. They may try to add some language like that. You could uh, agree to that. Um, another thing to come back with there, if they want to add that language to the memorandum of understanding, is to say, okay, well, but put in there that the union will recommend passage of the agreement and use its best efforts to secure passage of the agreement. Then you've got them sort of on record as uh, that this was a good deal. Uh, so that's something else to do. But make sure that you have some sort of memorandum of understanding before you leave. And then, you know, the last 15 minutes of our webinar today, we wanted to focus on two really critical issues, health care and pension liability. Um, I'm going to talk kind of briefly about health care. As everyone knows, health care continues to be one of those unknown increases that occur every year, even in non-unionized plans. Um, you know, you might get something from your broker on open enrollment that the private health insurance marketplace increases are going up 15, 20 percent. Um, so you want to look and evaluate what, your, what the plans are out there in comparison to the health and welfare plan. There may be very good reasons why you want to stick to the health and welfare plan. As I said, you know, in my negotiations that I'm having um, with Unite here in Philadelphia, you know, they're making the commitment that even though they don't know what the rate increases are going to be over the next few years, they have committed that they won't increase it more than 10% each year. I can tell you that our, you know, my small law firm's health insurance premiums went up more than 10% this year in just the private market. So it could be that, you know, the health and welfare plan is a good one. It has good coverage. It provides for dependent family care. Um, you, may, you may be in a city where they have really a really good clinic. Um, and it's something that your, your employees are really happy about. That's a benefit that they really value, and it's something that you can continue to send the message to them that you're not even going to worry about health and welfare. You're committed to making sure that, that their benefits are maintained. But there may be another options out there, too. There may be cheaper plans. You may decide and put a proposal that employees could opt out of the health and welfare plan, maybe because their spouse is already covered and they could get a, a payment for opting out. Lots of different creative things, and so you want to understand where the costs are, what, what is an important issue for your employees, and how you get there at the end of the day. You really do want to negotiate caps on contributions, particularly if, if the plan or the fund doesn't know what it's going to be in 2021, 2022. Things have changed. and so. Um, you know, you want to think about adding, okay, it's not going to go up more than 10%, or if it is going to go up more than 10%, we agree to come back to the game, come back to the table, sit down, have a reopener so that we can discuss whether we will agree to anything above whatever that flat percentage is. That's going to be important. It's also important to make sure that your employees are paying a percentage of a copay. Very rarely now do I see a contract where there is no employee copay into the health and welfare fund. That was true probably 10, 15 years ago, but really it's moving away from that, and it's very important that your employees understand that they need to pay and be a partner in their health insurance, and it makes them a little bit more accountable. Very briefly, um, at the beginning of 2020, uh, there's a new regulation from the Trump administration that employers can use health reimbursement arrangements to provide tax-free funds to employees so that they can buy their own health insurance. That, if that's something that could be useful to you or relevant to your workforce, you might want to think about considering that as a potential proposal in your upcoming negotiation. Okay, I'm going to uh, briefly discuss some of the withdrawal liability and, and try to stick with just the bargaining uh, aspects and implications of this. One of the uh, keys to remember here is that Kara briefly mentioned it, the union is not the pension fund. And so whatever the union says at the table, specifically regarding the pension fund, does not bind the pension fund. Um, the, you know, Kara said when you sign on to the CBA, it often has a provision that will say the parties agree to the trust agreement, you know, with the pension fund. Many employers, most employers that I deal with even, have never even seen that trust agreement, and yet they're bound by it. And that trust agreement may have uh, language that is, that is pretty alarming for employers, or maybe even increase the contribution op obligation that they have. 
Um, there, are, there are many things that can be can and are included in trust agreements that uh, should not just be agreed to without uh, thinking it through. And uh, you, you, should, you should check that out as part of your due diligence. In any event, remember when you're at the table, the union can look you right in the eye and they can shake hands with you and tell you this is how it's going to be with the pension, this is what we promised, and the pension fund is going to say, yeah, that's nice, but that's not what it says in writing. So it has to be in writing in order to bind the pension fund, and the union is not the pension fund, just remember that. So you need to pay attention to the terms of the CBA, even though that may not be the end story of your contribution obligation, it's certainly the, the beginning, and you need to make sure uh, as to your rate, your hours, are you supposed to contribute on overtime, do you pay on vacation hours, are there caps per week or month or, or uh, issues like that. I've found many, many employers that are contributing beyond, above and beyond what they should be under the terms of the collective bargaining agreement, and that's another uh, aspect of your preparation for negotiations that, that should be considered. Have the, the people that are making the contributions to these funds look at the actual contract and see if they're complying with the actual terms of the contract. You don't want to, years later, find out that you've contributed hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars more than you should have, especially to these failing pension funds, which are a complete disaster, and good luck getting your money back. Um, as far as withdrawal liability, I said that you need to ask for an estimate. You can do that once a year. They're supposed to uh, give you different uh, information, which I put there next to the, the uh, little hyphen. <clears throat> the one I want to emphasize is the application of any limitations. You may have already asked a, uh, uh, the pension fund for an estimate at some point in the past. Get one every year because it changes drastically, mostly for the, for the worse. In fact, almost always for the worse. But you still want to know what's going on. And this application of any limitations really means the 20-year payment cap, which I'll talk about here uh, in, in, in just a second. The pension fund may respond to your estimate, and they may give you a number and say, you know, if you withdraw, you're going to owe $15 million or something like that. In almost every instance that I see that, that's not actually true because the pension fund is so severely underfunded that the application of the 20-year payment cap would, would result in the employer paying less than the amount that the fund has stated as the so-called, quote, withdrawal liability. That's almost always the case because they're so severely underfunded. That's due to the 20-year payment cap, and the funds just ignore that when they respond to your estimate. And what they're really giving you is the number of uh, the, the amount of unfunded vested benefits. Unfunded vested benefits are not withdrawal liability, and we can have a whole other seminar about that. But just know, if you're thinking because of the estimate that the that the pension fund gave you, oh, there's no way we could ever get out of this fund because it would cost us X dollars. L let's have a chat because that's almost for sure not accurate. It may be that you can't get out of the pension fund, but like I said, you need to know the actual numbers so you make an informed decision. Um, you can get other information under other provisions of ERISA and you should consider that as well. How do you determine your withdrawal liability? Well, just a few quick pointers here. Um, they allocate some of your unfunded vested benefits and, and the way to understand that term is to know your employees within a pension have so-called vested benefits. Uh, they will be payable at some point in, in the future. The pension fund figures how much are we going to owe at X date in the future. Those are the uh, vested benefits. And then what portion of those are actually funded by the contributions? Nearly every pension fund out there today, all the multi-employer pension funds are severely underfunded and they owe, you know, uh, a ton more money in vested benefits than they actually have. That difference between what they owe and what they actually can pay is the unfunded vested benefits. They allocate a portion of that to each employer, generally dependent on their uh, level of uh, contributions to the fund over a, over a period of time. And then uh, that, that's the starting point for determining withdrawal liability. I mentioned the 20-year cap. I'll talk about that a little bit more. 
How you, would, how you would contribute your actual payment is pretty important to know because like I said, that estimate number that they've given you is generally these days overinflated. This is basically third grade math, how to figure out what you would actually owe. You figure out your contribution base units. Your contribution base units are what, you, what the unit is on which you contribute. For example, per week or per hour or per day or per shift. Most, most contracts are per uh, hour. You usually contribute so much per hour, let's say. If that's the case for you, then your contribution base unit is an hour. What you need to do, for the, there's, there's two factors that you look at before you make this calculation. The first is your contribution base units for the past 10 years. Don't include the current year. So if you're looking back from 2019, you would include years 2009 to 2018. You take the contribution base units, that's the number of hours for which you can, were legally obligated to contribute for each of those years. And you look at the three highest consecutive years out of those 10. Once you find those three highest consecutive years, you average them. You divide it by three, and that's your highest uh, contribution base unit average during the last 10 years. You take that figure and you multiply it by your highest contribution rate, also during your last 10 years, but including the current year. In every situation, nearly every situation I've ever, se ever seen, the highest contribution rate for an employer is their current contribution rate because it keeps on going up. I'll mention here briefly at the end the impact of the MPRA, which is the Multi-Employer uh, Pension Reform Act of 2014. You may be able to avoid uh, calculate using your current highest rate, um, and we'll talk about that just briefly. But once you have those two numbers, you multiply them together. That's your annual payment that you could be forced to pay. That's what you would actually pay, and they can only make you pay it, the pension fund can only make you pay it if you withdraw for 20 years. That's this 20-year cap idea. You have an annual payment. That formula under the, under the statute determines what that annual payment is. They can make you pay that for up to 20 years. After you've made 20 years of payments, even if you would still owe money towards the unfunded vested benefits, that's forgiven under the, uh, under the Act. Um, now, I mentioned this Multi-Employer Pension Reform Act increases in the contribution rate, quote, required or made in order to enable the plan to meet the requirement of a uh, funding improvement plan or rehabilitation plan shall be disregarded in determining, most important point there is the highest contribution rate. That means if your fund, like many others, is in so-called critical status and has a rehabilitation plan, those high year contributions may not be uh, countable against you for purposes of determining your highest contribution rate and withdrawal liability. That comes up, in, and I'll mention here in just a second, that comes up in bargaining when if you're staying in the fund to make sure that you get language to that effect to protect, to, to ensure that you can take advantage of, of that uh, act. Timing issues, it's very important when you're getting into bargaining to know um, uh, that the, the timing of withdrawal liability matters a lot. I had a case one time where the, uh, the date of withdrawal, the issue was whether it was December 31st or January 1st, and it made a multi-million dollar difference that one day. It matters, and you need to know what that is, and when the, uh, when you, when you uh, actually withdraw, if you withdraw. Kara mentioned impasse, uh, it's, it's hard to do, but if you ever were going to do it and it turned on withdrawal liability, the uh, obligation to contribute to the fund, it may be a, a slightly easier issue to go to impasse on because um, of how important it is and how the union's hands may be tied. As Kara said, the pension fund itself will, will uh, call the shots on what the contribution obligation is, and the, and the union often doesn't even have any say in it. All they're doing is presenting what the pension fund demanded of them, and so they won't be able to negotiate out of it. And that, uh, to my thinking, somewhat undermines their uh, obligation to bargain in good faith. They're stuck with it, and uh, if you're looking for an issue to go to impasse on, uh, that, that may be it. And remember that uh, if you did... Uh, have a labor dispute, a strike or something, and they went, uh, walked out, 
you could suspend the contributions during that time, and there's a specific provision of the Act that allows that. Um, as I said, if you determine that you're not getting out of the fund, you can still use a proposal to get out as big leverage to trade off uh, your continued participation for favorable wages, health care, other terms. Um, if you analyze your timing of uh, withdrawal liability, it may be to your advantage to stay in for a couple more years anyway while you wait for some of your, quote, high years to drop off because your annual payment would drop down. Uh, so th that's another reason why I say this is a critical issue and you really need to analyze it before you make the uh, determination to, you know, should I stay or should I go. Uh, indemnification language, you could ask the fund to indemnify you. I don't know any that would uh, readily agree to it. There have been a few cases where they did agree and regretted it, but most unions will just laugh. But one way you can use that to your advantage is to show the union's lack of credibility. If they're sitting at the table telling you and telling the employees, oh, that don't worry, this pension fund's around, it's in the, now it's in the green zone and it's all going to be fine, then you can say, well, then you won't mind indemnifying us for any withdrawal liability. And there's no way that they're going to agree to that. And it just illustrates that you can say, well, guess what? If it's so, uh, if it's so wonderful, how come you're not willing to hitch your wagon to it? And they won't be. Um, again, this, this, this slide here touches on whether you should uh, agree to the increases that are not required by rehabilitation plan. This generally won't come up because the pension fund will call the shots as to uh, um, the required contributions. But this, this goes to the Multi-Employer Pension Reform Act, and I think that uh, if you're going to stay in, consider including the specific language in there that would say that the increases that you're agreeing to were required under the rehabilitation plan, intended to comply with the MPRA, and that they won't be used for purposes of calculating withdrawal liability or the highest contribution rate. That tracks the language of the statute, and there's no reason the union shouldn't agree to it, although they will push back. But I think that that's something that you don't have to have the language in there in order to take advantage of the act, but it would be nice to have that understanding to point to because um, uh, many of the pension funds who, remember, are not bound by what the union says at the table are starting to take the position that the Multi-Employer Pension Reform Act uh, provisions don't apply to them and that they can use the highest rate when determining withdrawal liability. That would also be a separate uh, whole seminar that I could, that I could uh, bore you with, but uh, just know that you could avoid some of that if you got this language in. That's all that I'll say about withdrawal liability. I think Kara's got a couple slides here about post-bargaining considerations, and then we'll wrap it up. Back to you, Kara. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Hopefully you've yeah. concluded your negotiations. You've got a memorandum of understanding. You've got a new CBA. You've signed off on it, and everyone is happy. Make sure all of the hard work and time and effort that you've put into that is, does not fall away as soon as the contract is signed. So you want to make sure you're training everybody who's responsible for implementing the CBA on what the terms of the CBA is. It doesn't help you um, if you're making changes if you don't implement them or don't understand them. So, so do that. And then also keep your negotiations file updated, you know, write notes on strategies, issues for future bargaining so that you can go back with some lessons learned as to you know, who was at the table, what their strategies were, what their tone was, you know, what seemed to resonate and not resonate, um, so that you've got a really good starting session for your next round of bargaining. And then the last thing I'll touch on just briefly is if you are in the term of a CBA and you do have plant closures or furloughs, look at your CBA to assess whether you have the right to close the plant. Um, you want to make sure whether there is a duty to bargain over the decision to close the plant. Usually you do have a bargain, um, duty to bargain, not necessarily over the decision, but you do have a duty to bargain over the effects of that decision, and that requires you to provide notice, making sure that you're bargaining over issues such as severance or seniority, payment of benefits. Look at your collective bargaining agreement to see what happens if um, if, if the layoff would trigger a termination in California, for example, if you have a layoff that is more than 10 business days, it's considered a termination event under California law. And so you would have to pay out you know, final wages plus vacation plus PTO anyway 
Um, and then, you know, that's just by law, and then you'd have to look at what, what else you would need to do under the CBA. If it's a temporary shutdown, um, just for a few months, no withdrawal liability will be triggered. Um, withdrawal liability is only triggered with a permanent cessation of contributions. So with that, we'll answer some questions. We do have some coming in. So now's the time if you want to type into the Q&A. Mark and I will answer some questions for the remainder of our time. And don't hesitate, too, to check out our blog. We, we post about a lot of these issues, both from a union and non-union perspective. So please uh, sign up, um, read our blog. It would be great to get uh, some more visibility. And then I'll, if you have any other questions that you don't want to put in today or you think about after the session, don't hesitate to reach out to either Mark and I, and we will be happy to answer those questions. So for the first question that's come in, um, this is asking that if you, there is a company that has a sister company that is union, but the parent company is not, the sister is closed and the union is now coming after the parent to make it unionized. Um, what can they do in that situation? You want to look at, you know, the unionized CBA, the sister company, if um, what that has to do with accretion. Sometimes there might be situations where the CBA does cover other parts of the company, um, other locations um, elsewhere, either locally or outside of the jurisdiction. But if it doesn't, and the union is just coming after the parent to make it unionized through a union election or card check neutrality, that is something that you would want to address separately and try and you know, defend against making that other parent company unionized either through you know, really a, a, an election process. And I don't think I'll speak for Mark. Neither of us are fans of card check neutrality, and I think this board, the current board, would support that as well. Um, everyone should have an opportunity to make a free and fair choice in a, in a union election. Um, so there's a lot of strategies that you can implement to prevent um, and defend against any organizing attempt of a non-union parent. Mark, did you have any other thoughts on that question? No, I, I don't. I, I agree with what you said there. Any other questions? Well, if not, I'm going to stop the recording and appreciate everybody's time today and hope you found this webinar useful. Please fill out the survey that you'll get at the end, and Mark and I will circulate the presentation recording and the slides. And we hope that you're able to participate in future webinars. And if we can help you with any of your labor relations issues or future collective bargaining, please don't hesitate to reach out to Mark or I. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.